So I always, this is an anecdote I've told many times, I confess, but it's, uh, it goes back to Hamburg where I was a professor at the, at the Hochschule. And, um, and I, um, I did a, a, an exhibition at the museum there. Um, so there was a party afterwards with the Burgermeister and assembled guests. Um, and um, the mayor's wife kept stepping on my toes during and asking me to dance. So I went to a back room to sort of hide from the social situation for a moment. And a guy walked in with white hair, looking a lot like Albert Einstein. And I, um, uh, he came over and he said, uh, you're the artist, I understand? And I said, yes. He said, well, I thought you might like to have the favorite joke of my uncle Albert. And it was, in fact, the nephew of Einstein. And uh, I said, oh, great, I'd love to. He said, well, it was a conversation between man and God. And man said to God, listen, God, for you, what's a thousand million dollars? And God said, for me, it's only a minute. So God said, wow. Man said, wow. Uh, in that case, what is a million years? And uh, God said, for me, it's only a minute. And a uh, man looked at him and said, well, this and God, can I, can I have that money? <laughs> and God said, sure, just a minute. <laughs> All right, well, so so. <laughs> part, part one. After over 40 years of a kind of informal division in my work between temporary outdoor projects and works and installations and museums and galleries of a more permanent nature, I have found a particular pleasure in doing permanent public works. Working directly with a public space framed with other meanings than those associated with the specialized institutional ones within art presents a new challenge of a particular kind. The special task in doing such work is to make certain that it is appropriate to the context. How we define appropriate describes the interface between the viewer reader and the artist as a producer of meaning. This is in terms of both the focus of the work as a project with the subject area, as well as the social and cultural context of the community that receives it and must live with it. An important consideration, one which has made it a special challenge, is that such work must be accessible to a non-specialized audience, while at the same time providing an enriching cultural contribution uh, to it, as it makes a serious addition to the body of my work. The assignment is a different one from working in a museum, for example, which I presume a certain knowing audience. There's a kind of social contract to working in a space shared by many. And the artist has some responsibility to provide a level of attainable meaning. The task is to do that and not compromise one's problematic as an artist. However, long before I began doing public works with this objective, I found the public site an important one to locate my work. The second investigation was partially my own critical response to earlier work of mine utilizing photographs in both the photo, sorry, the proto investigations from 1965 with works such as One in Three Chairs and the first investigation begun in 1966, which was made of photographs. Uh, okay, this one. Uh, photographs, um, negative enlargements of texts such as dictionary definitions and, and etymological entries, which were, as a form of presentation, intended to be made and remade as a device to eradicate the aura and reliquary of painting so other questions could be raised about the nature of art and language. As a result, photography eventually emerged within what later 
was perceived as a kind of avant-garde practice and led me to abandon its use in 1968 for the next several years and to begin the second investigation and its use of anonymous public media. First, I show a few of the proto-investigations. While the fine art of photography had existed for some time parallel to the activity of painting, it had all the problems of painting. It was both old conservative with the popular appeal of realism and new conservative, media defined along with the best of modernism. In 1968, the arrival of work of colleagues of mine eventually to be associated with conceptual art, as well as the need of earthwork artists to have a gallery presence meant that photography was increasingly being seen as part of an avant-garde practice in ways which it had not since Man Ray and other Dadas earlier in the century. Thus, while this was a time when others were then beginning to use photography in their work, I came to the conclusion that photography was beginning to share many of the limitations of painting, defined formally and technically, be they the perception of other limits or innovation, and a priori establishing its meaning as art through the authority of such form. It seemed to me that all media-defined art activities were beginning to share this characteristic. For me, the nature of art had become the questioning of the nature of art. Yet forms of authority clearly stopped this questioning process. And in keeping with how Clement Greenberg defined modernism at the time, uh, the modernist institutional view of art was that it was comprised of a Kantian quest to find the limits of the medium. For me, however, the question was a larger one. How does art produce meaning, first about itself and then as itself in the world? To find this out, I felt I had to ask, how does art generate meaning as art outside of such a formally authoritative context? It was as a work in the world that we can not only understand how art produces its own meaning, but also how culture itself is produced. I turned to the use of public media as a presentation device for several reasons. It severed the event of the work from the kind of physical form of art which one associated with the high style of modernism. Since one didn't expect to find art in a space reserved for advertising, such as billboards or newspaper ads, it wasn't defined as art a priori. Uh, as painting, sculpture, or photography is. It made completely clear that a formalist approach to the work would be absurd. In this way, it uh, could not ap appeal to certain inherited forms for its validation as art. Yet in spite of this, it still was art. What this could then tell us was that there, would, well, there was more to the activity of art than say, the manipulation of forms and colors. It enabled me to separate the activity of art from this conventional understanding of what art could be. In this way, the work was able to ask questions within the practice itself, which a more traditional form of art could not. There was a political content to this process as well. My generation had real questions to ask of institutionalized forms of authority of any kind in 1968. Painting seemed insular and elitist. Using the organs of mass culture without the pandering to the masses, a la Walt Disney or product advertising, had a distinct appeal to me. And it reflected the particular interest of my political activism at the time. The second investigation was my response to this situation. While I felt such works, such as One in Three Chairs, had initiated such a questioning process, it was increasingly limited by this new reading being given to work using photography. The second investigation work used as its form of presentation, anonymous advertisements in public media, such as newspapers, magazines, billboards, handbills, as well um, as television advertising. This is understood to be the first known use of such a context for the production of artworks, and it should be seen as something specific and quite different from the billboard art 
which followed in the next decade, where this presentational strategy was often used as an end in itself. The content of the advertisements I utilized in 1968 were based on a taxonomy of the world but developed by Roger as, does not, as the synopsis of categories for use in his thesaurus. Each ad was an entry from the synopsis, which in effect put into the world the fragments of its own description. What this initiated, of course, was a questioning of the ontology of artworks, the role of context, of language, of institutional framing, of reception. For me, the concern of this work focused clearly on what was to remain a central concern of my art. It was apparent to me by the mid-1960s that the issue for new work was not around the materialization or dematerialization of a work. In fact, it was not even concerned with materials. The issue which defined my work, as well as that activity which became known as conceptual art, was the issue of signification. What are the questions and, uh, pertaining to the function of meaning in the production and receptions of works of art? What is the application and what is the limit of language as a model in both the theory and the production of actual works? Then following from that, what is the role of context, be it architectural, psychological, or institutional, on the social, cultural, and political reading of work? It was these issues that separated conceptual art from the modernist agenda, which preceded it. And it is this non-prescriptive practice which has remained flexible enough to endure and quite obviously continues to provide a basis for conceptual art's relevance to recent art practice. Indeed, what is interesting is that when I started my activity, it had to have a special name, conceptual art. But the work of younger artists now, fortunately, can just be called art. This was in a show in Bern that Harry Zeman did called um, when attitudes become form. The seventh investigation in 1970 employed a banner over a street in Torino, Italy. It was a psychologist working model of the concept of abstract. You may find this, well, let me show you. You may find this photograph familiar because it was on the back cover of Germana Chalant's first museum exhibition titled Conceptual Art, Arte Povera, and Land Art in Torino. These slides are from the same series and are all the same text. At present, my approach to public art aspires to integrate several aspects that are important to the location. They attempt to provide a monumental view to the experience of members of a particular community to their own historical presence and manage to do so without the normal sentimental and institutional aspect of city monuments. As a work of art, its context becomes the content. Again, it's the architectural, the social, the psychological, and the cultural, as well as the historical terrain which binds them. With this objective in mind, such work utilizes both the historical and cultural aspects of its location and its role in contemporary life. In such projects as mine, the experience of the work becomes one and the same as the architectural environment in which the work is seen, humanizing what is often experienced by individuals as a depersonalized public building. It is for this reason that such art uh, project, such an art project must be seen as integrated, both in conception and in fabrication, as part of the whole urban experience and not be treated as a separate additional object which was added afterwards as more traditional public art uh, work often is. The buildings of any community are the repository of the life which has taken place there and its accumulated meanings. This is finally what history consists of. But you ask, what are these works which I've built and why? In fact, how is it even your work since the words are the words of others? I would answer like this. As artists, we all begin with construct with what is given. We appropriate fragments of meaning from the detritus of culture and construct other meanings which are our own. And in the same sense, all writers write with words invented by others. 
One uses words with prior meaning to make paragraphs which have a meaning of one's own. It was clear by the mid-1960s that the existing constitutional form of art, the paradigm of painting and sculpture, could no longer itself constitute being a paragraph of one's own. It had for artists become the sign and signage of the idiospace of modernism, an over and rich context of historicized meaning signifying itself and collapsing new meaning under its own weight. By reducing any ingredient of cultural prior meaning to being a smaller constructive element, a word element, I could then construct other meanings at another level, producing a paragraph of my own and still remain within the context of art sufficiently, I felt, to alter it. This has been a basic aspect of my practice and has for over 40 years, maybe 50 at this point, um, necessitated some form of appropriation. And it is evidence throughout my work, beginning with examples such as One of Three Chairs, to the play The Unmentionable at the Brooklyn Museum, 1991, uh, as well as now to a present projects such as One Field to the Next uh, in, in Taiwan. Others have asked, is work such as yours visual and are you concerned of whether it is beautiful? And I confess, I cannot distinguish between visual and conceptual when the knowledge of a work's elements and its internal play is acquired visually. A concept must be communicated to be known. In fact, eliminate the legacy of formalism and the question becomes nonsense. The reading of the text and understanding the play between them and between them and the architecture is all visual. In any case, I certainly accept as a potential given all of the meanings and experiences which the work generates, including both beautiful or ugly. However, I think to understand the work in terms of it having a history and a context is to comprehend the very limited role traditional aesthetic reception has to this work's deeper meanings. In other words, the extent of the role of traditional aesthetics in the play of the work is provided by the viewer reader and providing that by them probably risks blocking their appreciation of the work. Still, aesthetic responses to one's experiences, whatever they are, are hard to control or deny. One can, however, more easily control the desire to theorize about them. I think of the comment of Roland Barthes, a text is not a line of words releasing a single theological meaning, but a multidimensional space in which a variety of writing, none of them original, blend and clash. The text is a tissue of quotations drawn from the innumerable centers of culture, end of quote. To make a work which plays with the history is, of course, to acknowledge that such a work is a play on the postponement of meaning, it is a play of delay. All you can see of my contribution is a view of the artistic process itself. For when meaning is the material of one's work, it remains a gap, something between the lines. It is, however, through that gap that art sees the world and then begins to change it. Part two. Oh, sorry, that was, that went with the last part. <laughs> This was a, basically the Brooklyn Museum did this, it was a lobby show, and the truck would arrive and people would show a piece of sculptures, whatever. So they invited me, and I said, can I do anything I want? <laughs> and um, they said, sure. So um, I went into the museum, and I pulled work sound um, uh, out of different departments, and began to show really, shall we say, the problematicity of um, our culture, all the things that were problematic, all the scandals, all the um, things that raised questions rather than providing answers. Um, and the show it was in, uh, my biggest public success in the sense that I was on CNN for a week being interviewed, but also there was many articles in three, I think, in the New York Times. And, um, 
and I broke attendance records at the Brooklyn Museum and kind of put it on the map a bit. I mean, it's been there for a while, but um, people began to see things that they hadn't seen before, which was what the purpose of it was. Some hilarious comments. Um, there's, um, I can't really take the time, unfortunately, to tell you all the different things going on in this, but it was um, uh, very instructive as an exhibition. Part two. In the 1980s, I dedicated my practice to the culture exegesis of Sigmund Freud's work. The images on the screen show examples of this production, in particular a series of mine titled Zero and Not. Here we have a cluster of contingencies, a text which represents an order of arbitrary forms which makes a systemic sense believable while they teach belief. The words are meaningful contingently in relation to the sentence and the sentence to the paragraph. The paragraph from the psychology, sorry, psychopathology of everyday life by Sigmund Freud is meaningful in relation to the exposition of Freud's work. The use of Freud's work in this context is continuing on understanding how I use zero and not as a kind of conceptual architecture, as a ready-made order that, while anchored to the world, provides as a theoretical object a dynamic system. This text, though, is also just a device, a surface, a skin. There is another syntax also anchored, anchored to the world, which is the architecture of rooms, which also orders this work. While the order remains there, the gaps and omissions, the entrances, exits, views in and out, which, that which puts the work in the world, rather than disrupt the order clarifying and qualify the room as the world and art, which it is not, but within this order is. The cluster of arbitrary orders also has a um, made order which unifies it. And beyond the unification given to it by our, the architecture of the room itself, it begins with a counting off of the paragraphs repeated until the walls are full. And that constellation which constructs as it erases suggests one thing, a field of language itself, present while removed. Not just absence presented, it is, a language, it is a language reduced to words, making the texture of reading itself uh, an arrival at language, an arrival which constructs other orders, ones that blind as they make themselves visible. The numbers separate the paragraphs as they unify the work. This provides the field in which the color coding systemically underscores repeatedly the fragments that make up the unitary paragraph a made-up order which constructs or deconstructs the paragraph differently than the other order of the world, which makes the paragraph with the sentences, and differently, too, than that order which makes rooms out of doors and windows and changing ceilings, and those walls which presume the lives which will be lived within them. This was um, a, a well-known show by Jan Hoot, called Chambre de Me, and this was the, the house, the office of a um, psychoanalyst who he turned it over to me, and I did this throughout the whole, um, his whole, the whole house, and it still remains. You can make an appointment to see the shrink or to see <laughs> my work. And, um, well, this is the waiting room. If you weren't crazy when you got, when you were, were, before you arrived, you were by the time you left. They don't believe in crazy. It's not a technical term, you know. Okay, but anyway. Leo was always trying to get me to use this space. And I saw every show I saw there, the, the space crushed the work. And I said, nah, I don't think so. And then uh, I, when I did the one in Lyon, the first slide, I called Leo and I said, I've got your show. And this was what ended up being. It's on Green Street in Soho, New York.
So finally, after, I don't know, 14 cities doing this work, um, these are just a couple. Uh, there's a lot more slides. Um, I found myself, the, the Sigmund Freud Museum in Vienna, which had been the cradle of psychoanalysis, Burgas at 19, for those of you who are up on this stuff, um, and, and invited me in. They had just purchased the apartment of Freud, uh, which was across the hall from his famous office. And they said, uh, they're, they're doing a big conference of, uh, uh, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Freud's death. And uh, they asked me if I would you know, do something. So um, I did something, and I found myself um, in the bedroom where Freud did his dreaming for 36 years. Um, and I said, listen, if I don't quit with Freud now, I'll never quit. So this is the last of my Freud works. <laughs> closer to home. I did, uh, the, uh, I did a big, one big installation in the, in the uh, main room of, at Akka, but also the, I did a, a little kind of s slightly a retrospective of some installation works. And this was, and I did uh, a, a room uh, from the zero knot here. This was a lot, much larger show of, uh, of various in, uh, installation works. This was the component, which was zero and not. Architecture provides the possibility of a meta text. The integrity of the perceived whole of a room, a building, a facade, anchors the separate and fragmented text into a systemic unit with contra contradiction simply one form of articulation of that whole. In this way, the work uh, is a work on language, but in terms of the interrelationships of those various perceptions of a whole. Since each individual fragment is itself a whole. In this, uh, since my use of image and or text functions with the same weight within each work as a play of language, and the use of borrowed images is as much a work on or with language as are the stolen texts. The architecture provides the confines of the play at the same time as it locates the work and its meaning in the world. Architecture, a space formed by social use, describes as it prescribes a social meaning to its ceilings, walls, doors, windows, and the floors, and the psychological impact it constructs along with that use. In this way, the role of architecture as part of the play enacts as it, re as it represents the world. The position of the viewer reader located as they are at a remove by being within the social and psychologically constructed areas of architecture standing in the world are permitted a view of the total play of text, the meta text of the work itself. Installations as a structural or constructive element can be seen to often be conceived by the artist as a kind of stage set, an autonomous one, built to generate the play which follows from it. The play is self -con a connecting and disruptive narrative of discourse, of historical and cultural references, makes formal association with both art and non-art sources, and contains both social and political meaning which within a cultural view, along with the psychological and other associative responses to an architectural setting already internalized as part of the installation. The play arrives with the viewer and it and consists of the approach itself toward what the viewer finds there. The dialogue as initiated is provided by this discourse and it begins as an interior one. The theater of which I speak is one anchored in the world and as installation, it has been a liberating platform for practicing artists who established it as their own postmodern zone of play. The actors in this play are without, are without a script, and the viewing audience and the actors are, in fact, one and the same. Neither the fictive nor the properly theatrical are to be found in the program of this artistic enterprise. 
There's no need for absorption nor a passage to transcendence. There's only a construction within a cultural discourse at a moment of our own history. One having a language that needs to be seen as an interface where meaning in this world is in the process of construction. It is a meaning which shows, constructed in a way which is specific to art. And its assertions are no less significant philosophically or culturally for being manifested and implicit. Installations arrived at a result of the need of artists to produce works which were in the world, whether employing objects or not, but which were not framed by the limits imposed by the fictive space requirements of modernist sculpture and painting. Thus, in important ways, installations were also free of the ideological baggage of modernism, particularly given the consequences of the hijacking of late modernism by Greenberg, Fried, and their followers. That their contribution was seen at the time as more than just an intellectual event in academia, where it has since been consigned, remains a cur curiosity for my generation. One can now see that the contribution then was primarily negative because there emerged no art of any significance which was generated by or had the support and positive influence of this theory. Its role was primarily one of a negative framing and misreading of work, such as pop, art, or minimalism, which in fact has since proven to be both significant and consequential. If by reactionary one means a response intended to maintain the status quo, this certainly defines the efforts of Greenberg Fried at all. It was the theoretical shoring up of a form of art that was already beginning to lose its relevance that was certainly obvious to many of us even then, and is simply a fact now, some 40 some years later. The lesson here is about the power of art to define its own self-conception within the practice itself as it participates in shaping the culture of its time. What it also reveals is the limited value and effect of any theory without the anchor of an actual artistic practice supporting it. The system of beliefs which accompanies and shapes the view of an object intended as art, as being not simply an object, but as a construction, was for me exactly where the rupture needed to take place. And it was the location where a practice concerning with why found itself with a mission that felt at the time like historical necessity. It should be said that even if still modernist in many ways at the time, Minimalism, nonetheless, was important for making a break, which showed the way out of that swamp of meaning which sculpture and painting increasingly represented. This was long before the market turned minimal art back into sculpture for its own purposes. The view from the balcony now is a view which includes both modernism and postmodernism. And the terrain we see is one built over the past 30 or 40 years and resulting in another culture with other expectations and a different mission. If Johns showed us how a canvas wasn't a window into another space, installations constituted a leap and a break. They are already in the world we inhabit and the effect they have is meant to happen there. The questions our work, uh, the questions our work beca became free to ask are a result of us as artists finding ourselves there. The work which this has initiated in the past decades has shown that playing, that playing field to be a fertile one, as has the theory also initiated by institutional critique, which in its various forms has benefited most significantly. It is, actually, it is actual works upon which art theory must be anchored, and without the discourse begun by conceptual art's earliest works, such a conversation couldn't be taking place. I did a map of this space and enlarged it to the size of the space itself and made it into wallpaper. And this is a dialogue about, about architecture first, but also um, about um, how we make the kinds of meaning we make with architectural spaces. It is no accident my first major show at Leo Castelli Gallery in 1971, after my previous smaller one there of the second investigation 
1969, was the eighth investigation, now in the Panza collection, comprised of a large table, 12 chairs, uh, 24 wall clocks, and 12 notebooks filled with appropriate text taken from various authors on function, tautology, and time. The viewer reader, as I called the audience for this work at the time, was expected to sit down and read and to make the connections within a field of contingency of meaning that the order of the clocks facilitated. Whatever absorption this work required was in the reading of the text. And the fictive space requirements of convention and modernity died right there. On the wall and in the notebooks was a chart and mode d'emploi, which was ended with my declaration of the work as postmodern. This was in 1971, and it was on the same wall in the same room that Jasper Johns' first flag painting was shown some years before. Even without, even without any intention to self-historicize, one still might pause to say that there is a history and mission to the practice of which I speak, and it's important to know it, know it fully to understand that aspect of postmodernism which installation work constitutes and which emerged in the following decades. The, the, uh, the material of an installation is first a psychological and social experience provided by the room's architecture. This results from the meaning of the social and cultural history of its use along with the combined experience of the psychology of that particular architectural context added to our prior architectural experience. We know and experience that while we also know we are standing in the world. We also know in a museum or gallery that, like anything else, its being there could be of limited duration, but we suspend that understanding. The world, as that location, that institution, or place of cultural activity, will change and continue in another way. This location in time provides temporary installations, that texture of history, which is part of one's immediate experience of them. There are other aspects to permanent installations which make them valuable in another way, but to understand both better, we must begin with the temporary. The point is that an installation work, even a temporary one, insofar as the experience of the work goes, is attached to a location. It's fixed as part of the architecture and seals its fate along with the history and culture of that uh, one location in the world. The implication being quite unlike the free-floating object that transcends any particular place, finding its aura in the market on its way to the final resting place of the heavenly museum. It is the loss of the sense of self with absorption which removes the viewer from the here and now and makes the experience of a fictive space even possible. Why installations are so intrinsically linked with this understanding of postmodernism is that their commitment to a location links them to the here and now and is, and is yet discursively part of what makes them art. And as such, as art, they can do so while they remain in the world. The work you see on the screen was originally conceived of an occasion for the Edinburgh Festival uh, in, in 2009 in the University of Edinburgh's Talbot Rice Gallery. This is where the young Charles Darwin studied stuffed birds that filled the vitrines at that time. In reference to this installation project uh, was titled, an interpretation of this title, Nietzsche, Darwin, and the Paradox of Content, was later shown in Sydney at Anna Schwartz Gallery in 2010. The drawings of Charles Darwin, as depictions of a scientific order being posited, are maps of relations as much as representations of the face of science as a belief in its making. They constitute both the creativity and a truth to be. We have a historical view of the formation of our beliefs and their exegesis from the hand of a man. We have at the same place a horizon line of two texts by Nietzsche, which sets the perspective of the total installation, a comment on the play of its parts. This provides both the self-reflection as well as the deeper edification of the work's combined elements to be understood and experienced as a whole as they simultaneously provide a warning and a critique of the work's presumptions. Above, on the mezzanine level, I guess I should go back, maybe. Ah, it doesn't go back. All right. Um, where was that? 
on the, yeah, on the mezzanine level is another kind of map of relations which shadow and illuminate science as constituted by the drawings of Darwin below. The web of connections between these quotes of Nietzsche follows interior arguments concerning art and nature to art and science to art and philosophy. Uh, this tree of relations elliptically self-reflects on Nietzsche's view of how art as a construction serves the self and asserts the self-made. In this view, the truth claims of science are put in suspension in order to propose as an aesthetic, pro to propose an aesthetic project that, while being located externally, posits an understanding manifested by being asserted indirectly and yet no less as an e epistemic restraint and thus, honestly. As Nietzsche stated, quote, our ultimate gratitude is to art. If we had not welcomed the arts and invented this kind of cult of the untrue, then the realization of general untruth and mendaciousness that now comes to us through science, the realization that delusion and error are conditions of human knowledge and sensation would be utterly unbearable. Honesty would lead to nausea and suicide. But now there is a counterforce against our honesty that helps us avoid such consequences, art as the goodwill to appearance. You've got to love Nietzsche. No, I mean, come on. One cannot hope to prescribe work having an engagement with questions concerning the production of meaning to always turn out results that are either well designed and aesthetically pleasing along the lines of long received criteria of attraction and market desirability. Nor, with any more or less likelihood, should we expect a rigorous and prescriptive form of visible uncanniness, of demonstrating an ugly or non-art gravitas to be a part of the experience either. Such an insistence ultimately functions as a form of style. How one makes it work must be in the service of why it is being made. To that end, a work can look like anything at all, including not necessarily being visible at all. Beyond the signifying needs inherent in how the work must manifest itself and what is required for it to construct the meaning that it does, how it looks really doesn't matter beyond its role in that requirement. We do know that historically new art, when it's making a contribution, contribution to the history of ideas, often doesn't look like art. Driven primarily by artistic intention, such work, if judgment is the issue, must be judged by its own standards, those standards required for the work's reception, which permits it to be put in play culturally. The viewer reader must also be armed, apparently, with the admonition that seeing isn't as simple as looking. Sorry. <laughs> The installation work you are currently seeing on the screen was developed for the architecture of the Australian Center of Contemporary Art, ACA, in Melbourne, curated by Juliana Egberg in 2010. The text, written in warm white neon and partially blackened out on the front surface, are comprised of passages from the dialogue of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, put in play in relation to his lesser known writing, Texts for Nothing. The illuminated ish, image is that of Caspar David Friedrich's painting, Two Men Looking at the Moon, 1819, which is considered to be the painting that inspired Beckett to write Waiting for Guiteau. Abandoned for years by the minor, sorry, by the major critics of Beckett's work and rarely included in anthologies of his writing, Texts for Nothing was seen as outside of the mainstream <coughs> of Beckett's writing. Previously viewed as somewhat of a pause in the overall of Beckett. For me as an artist approaching his work, this writing for my purposes is quintessential Beckett, the perfect example of his particular artistic integrity. Beckett's project as an artist has been instructive to me and touches on questions which occupy my own work. That is, a concern with meaning. One of the many differences, of course, is that Beckett approaches the question of meaning from its absence, and in my work, I've been concerned with how meaning is made. But that said, the approach can neither be obvious nor singular. Text for Nothing is the least narrative 
of all of Becker's writing and has been mo most useful to me. To manifest descriptions of parts unsaid and only to be seen in Beckett is to, one second, is to underscore that this work, and that is also my work, waits for the viewer reader, that it is a process and it is incomplete. It is work that only begins, it does not end. The work is made possible by what is shared in both works. This work, in both senses, constitutes language itself. It is self-described, and as an object, it is one constructed as an absence, an absence from which our questions about meaning can flow, even if only through a lack that manifests itself as a form of desire. With Beckett, we have language, self-erasing as it arrives, seeing itself reflected in the collapse of its own significance, and meaning being manifested through confrontation with its own nothingness. Meaning here is what is left behind as a kind of re residue of the word's effect. In the case of Waiting for Godot, it has been described as a drama concerned with the collapse of language, belief, and ultimately meaning. By doing so, Beckett bears the device of all other theatrical projects, before and after. The how of traditional, even modern theater pales, even becomes meaningless in the face of the why that is revealed as quite possibly unsupportable. Not unlike the philosophical project of Ludwig Wittgenstein or the artistic project of Ad Reinhardt, saying what's not possible may be the only approach to showing what is. The project is to glimpse in passing what it would be like to believe and where meaning may be found. This postmodern project, however, one of the process, out of the process of an etymological like formative historical path of growth within culture has internalized a carried over feature of modernism. This can be seen to be that art requires a self-definition, even if a continually transformatory one, to be put in play in the service of maintaining the recognition of itself, that of having a quality of transitory autonomy. This feature is a necessary one for art to be readable and meaningful in a given cultural and historical moment. This is the operative play of art and is part of the nature of the dynamic of its own inherent cultural force to self-describe itself in relation to the world in which it finds itself, even if always in a way which is subject to revision by the practitioners of culture themselves, who must embrace it? It is this internal drive of art toward implicit autonomy that provides its traction with the world. Art's ultimate refusal to participate with the world as a knowing partner within the context of other meanings, corporate, religious, entertainment, et al., is how it preserves and maintains its own particular, if non-prescriptive, character. Viral life, like, as Felix Gonzalez Torres put it so eloquently, art's paradoxical dialectic requires that it must take on the forms and meanings of the world of the living and borrowing freely as part of a dynamic of an interior order which protects its identity as something other than the world in order to make meaning for the living in the world. That which distinguishes the actual production of art from that of paintings by monkeys or the drawings of children is that intentional act manifesting a specific kind of meaning, art, within, cult within human cultural and social meaning, one which necessitates an individual's intention of taking subjective responsibility for that act, and without which such an activity can have no political life. Without such a profile of autonomy, art could never see itself. That is, it would lose its self-reflexivity, and thus its capacity as a critical and political force within culture. Or as Gaston Bachelard put it, as soon as art becomes autonomous, it makes a fresh start. In this way, art manifests itself as a continual and dialectical new beginning. As part of its own autonomous spiral, it must be able to see itself, which also means see, it, see the world in itself as it proceeds. This self-reflexive moment constitutes in culture the basis for its political life as a critical space and a transformatory moment within its role as part of the production of consciousness itself. And as it does so, Human intention takes on its role as the producer of meaning along 
with the subjective responsibility for having done so, and thereby anchors the cultural sentence, the cultural blah, discourse of which it is a part of the historical moment in which it happens. It is this which gives art its authenticity, both in the present and for future generations. Part three. I will include in this slide presentation photographs of some of my permanent public works, but not all at once, since some are parts of other series of works. <laughs> It'll be clearer later, I hope. Um, Ex Libris, Jean-François Champollion Fijac, 1991, Place de Fijac, France. This work continued my use of the ready-made text, which began in the 1960s. Since art begins with borrowed material, a condition usually masked by the naturalization of habit and the authority of a tradition. Just as an author writes with words invented by others, I said that already, but anyway, yet still claims the personal expression and subjective responsibility of authorship, I also use words, sentences, and paragraphs, sometimes even books and whole libraries written by others. Meaning is produced within the context of his work. Ex libris use work, quotes by writers or thinkers that represents a body of theory or literature that has made a significant contribution to present day culture. The voice of these texts is authoritative. These, their meanings are independent of my intention while they are simultaneously employed by me in the production to generate my own meaning, which is context dependent. This work was the result of a commission from Jack Long, at the time Minister of Culture, to, commem to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Jean-Francois Champollion. For me, it was a work on meaning itself more than simply a celebrating a man. It was a simple but rich solution to the problem without the sentimentality or patriotic gloss that one associates with monuments. It is appropriate for its context virtually every way, historically, culturally, and socially. And the fact that it also is also a staircase that links two parts of Fijac that had not been so easily passable previously made it more than a symbolic addition to the town. The only monument for Walter Benjamin in Frankfurt. It's right along the, it goes around, but this is a, actually a fragment of it. It's Walter Benjamin on architecture. Unfortunately, I can't go into depth. I'm just, this is like a, a quick overview. Document a nine by Jan Hoot. When Schiller was a little boy, his father was the gardener here. Uh, it was just a, a, a green uh, square. And I did this hedge uh, uh, monument as, uh, for the uh, celebration of it, uh, the anniversary of the university. It makes use of a quote from Mon by Mondrian. In English, it would be, we can do one of two things, make a work of art or make an aesthetic object. Both are subject to the same laws, but the outcome is altogether different. Let us leave aside the question of whether art is necessary. Our goal is the creation of a useful and aesthetic environment. That's, that's what you get out of there in Dutch. <laughs> one aspect of my original reason to use neon in 1965 was that it was already part of popular culture as signage. It didn't have high art associations. It was also clearly a temporary form of public writing. Since neon only functions for a certain time and then is repumped or, or remade, I was taking a popular form of communication and instead of announcing a product, I was using that, to, that voice to say something else. At the Palazzo Quinir in Sampaglia in 1997 in Venice, I did the material ornament, which was part of Sarajevo 2000 exhibition of the Venice Biennale. 
The source for this was a text by John Ruskin dated from the middle of the 19th century. Ruskin's goal was to list the elements that constituted architectural ornamentation. In my work, I was also curious to see if I could stand some of my, excuse me, some of my own presumptions on their head and do a work about decoration and ornamentation, fairly taboo, which nonetheless, at the same time, was a reflexive state of its own decorative role, even if in contradiction. I was interested in the idea, oh, one second. I was interested in taking the idea of a theoretical model of ornamentation and using that as ornamentation. For me, this work functions as a structure with a reference to tautological models, an interest of mine uh, nearly 30 years ago, but without the meaninglessness one associates with tautology. It stays within the circuitry of art, but it's an art that is in the world and its history. Indeed, the act of putting into play the, the play of art a theoretical text on decoration, as decoration itself, is not without irony, but irony is not the goal. What we would want to call irony, and can, is also the internal tension, which collapses expectation and shows how art is the constructing of meaning made visible. The architect uh, is Hara, Miyaki is where the first Japanese dictionary was written, and it is on deposit in this library. It was based on the first American dictionary called Webster's. My work employed text from both of, the, of those first dictionaries. At the time, this was the tallest building in uh, Japan, and my work, there, um, 500,000 people a day see it if they look. <laughs> this is for the, an the anniversary of the um, University of Amsterdam. There were um, about 12 of these that were, in, uh, I based it on scandals in each college, uh, in each of the colleges of the university, um, problematic moments, et cetera. Um, and it goes throughout the uh, university. This work is now, um, been uh, after the Cultural Capital Europe mo event was over, it was purchased by the Moderna Museum, and it's on. And one, uh, one of the two texts is on the facade of the Moderna Museum, and the other is in the end in the main hall. This is interesting. There was a, uh, I was invited to ask if I could do an artwork for the new Tokyo train station. And I was thinking about it, and then they contacted me and said, I'm sorry, there's a dispute between people who want advertising in the organization and people who want artworks. And we've come up with a, um, a, a compromise in which we ask artists to do advertisements. And I said, well, no thanks, I'm, it's not what I do. So then they finally came back to me and said, well, we have something you might be interested in, which is the only Zen Buddhist university in Japan wondered if you would do their ad. And I said, that sounds interesting. So I did that. It's also a building by Hara. This monastery, uh, which is quite a well-known space, um, artists like Jenny Holzer have done shows there, many, many people you know, probably. Um, and um, basically, though, it was a, um, uh, there was a library there which burnt down. And um, some, in, in some past century. And so these are, what I did on the floor were the lists of the bo books that were lost in the fire. Uh.
this is where one of the Medici's lived. He had his collection there. It was quite the social center of that period of life in Rome. And then um, his brother couldn't have children. And so he had to pack up and go back to Florence to keep the Medici family going. Some art historians is not probably having their skin crawl by this quick description. Anyway, so what I put were the works that had been shown there, the titles. So it's about absence. But actually, the work is really about, I can say now, uh, the death of Gino de Domenici, who was my best friend in Rome. So it's about absence. Uh, this is the uh, Kustal in Basel. Uh, the director, Peter Pakish, was a gallerist in Vienna before. And um, four of the artists he worked with for some years um, were not eligible for him to work with because it's, the program was emerging artists. So he picked uh, the four of us out of that, his group of artists, um, which um, were uh, influential on this new generation of artists. And basically what I did was, this is the ceiling of the Kunsthalle. I took um, a list of, of, of artists who died in 1968 and a list of artists born in 1968. And this sort of ended up covering a whole lot. This wall is where Hanover's name is, is derived. If you know the Castello Sant'Angelo, Hadrian's tomb, um, there was a, a, this was a show that was t temporarily called God, organized by the um, uh, Cardinal of Rome, the um, head rabbi of Rome, and um, someone else I'm, I'm forgetting. Uh, anyway, and so um, I began a project there that ended up going to lots of cities later. We seem to have a problem. Techie! Have you ever seen a presentation where there wasn't a problem? It's stuck. You don't have to run, it's not smoking yet. <laughs> so anyway, that show went, and what I would do is I kept adding languages. It was the word meaning in, in the languages of people living there. And um, this is a wonderful tower in, off in the water near Molfetta, which is in um, Puglia north somewhere, vaguely, north of uh, Bari. And so this went to various places. Oops, that was a little quick, sorry. Um, this was a show uh, called The Sea in Honor of Jan Hoot, um, uh, who died, and this, um, where the, the artists who had worked with him were invited. I don't know. Oh, I think I slipped by this. Yeah, there was a window. I missed it. Anyway, I'll tell you what the... It's uh, located work Sapporo. Uh, is my second work in a series that began in 1999 with a commission from the city of Singen, Germany. The former presentation of this work, located World Singen, utilized warm white neon textual elements along the top frieze of the city hall of the town. The second work, located World Sapporo, of which there were slides a little bit back, uh -huh, was the commission artwork for the new Astrodome constructed for the 2002 uh, Soccer World Cup in Sapporo. This work, which measured 15 meters by 500 meters, was silk screened on the glass curtain walls uh, windows of the Astrodome. Both works located their specific orientation in relation to the rest of the world. The, this map of the world consisted of signposts of cities and towns became a global configuration by list. 
all the more so due to the arbitrary basis of its inclusive procedure. One local articulation which is definitive of these works is the inclusion of towns nearby the one place never mentioned but central to the work, i.e. Singen and Sapporo. Those were only two at that time. Torino is the town where Nietzsche lost his mind. So I thought I should, something had to be done, you know, for that. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, I was ahead of myself. But anyway, that's what I just read to you about. So the closer the town, the bigger the, the size of the, of the town uh, that's on the wall. The farther away, the smaller. This is Piazza Dante in Naples, for those of you. This, uh, every year they would invite an artist to do a big work over uh, New Year's. Uh, it would be up for about, I think, uh, uh, th three months or so. And um, it's one of those spaces that it was very difficult to work with quite daunting. So um, at that time, uh, that was the largest work I'd ever done. Um, OK, uh, rethinking the truth. This work is a result of a once annual invitation to an artist to do a temporary work in the main square in Naples. I presented an obscure test by Benedetto Croce pertaining to the concept of truth. For this work, I reviewed the thinkers who, shall we say, were associated with Naples, who lived there a long time, or who were born there. But obviously, also, my connection with Naples would be another starting point. Croce is someone I'm interested in, yet whom I never had worked with. But at the same time, I tried to find a text which was not the one uh, which would immediately be associated with him, that is, the ones which were already well known. To begin with, I ref prefer to find something a bit off the track. If it is immediately identifiable, one risks it being too much of a voice of authority rather than an invitation to think. I also thought, and this goes to the heart of an artist's responsibility, to connect with the non-specialist with the new public work, that this particular sentence would be a relevant Christmas message and also a sort of commentary on this particularly difficult moment we are in. Well, that just remains eternally true, doesn't it? Um, obviously, these are secondary issues to the actual problematic of my work. But nonetheless, I thought it would connect with the people passing by the square who do not necessarily have an engagement with art, but reflect on the work in another kind of way. One of the things that are important about art is that, in some way, the viewer is obliged to complete the meaning that the artist initiated. And in that way, a lot of people are put in a position to have a relationship with culture. Of course, I mean an alternative one to the passive relationship one has with television or cinema. I think art should oblige people to be engaged and to think not only about what that artwork says, but also about the thinking behind that message, the reasons why one would present a particular text. In other words, what it means on a variety of levels. So although I take full responsibility for the totality of the work, the viewer is invited to read the different levels of reading. I like to talk about art in philosophical terms, but do not like to give a key answer to a particular work. Otherwise, I eliminate that part of the process, which is the viewer readers. So at an entry point, it functions when the work is something like an enigma. What happened, though, was that I had been full page articles for months about this work. It was uh, the the man, the, 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 the president of the region, like the governor equivalent, um, uh, had a fight with the mayor of Naples, of which he had been before, although they were in the same party. She was a very good, good Catholic and saw this thing about relativizing truth was problematic. And 
So um, this was during the, the years of Berlusconi, you remember him, and his uh, uh, Minister of Culture was interviewed on Rai and um, was asked about the scandal in Naples about this work by Kasuth. And uh, he said, well, let me respond this way. I had uh, a, an audience three days ago with the Pope, and I asked him what he thought about Kasuth's work. And the Pope said, I do not support the work of Kasuth because it relativizes truth. Well, it's really Croce relativized truth, not me. But anyway, and I said, finally, you get, I had the great opportunity to piss off a pope. <laughs> not ever, that was the thing artists used to do, remember? Okay. <laughs> so now we go tripping up to Berlin. This is my um, a daunting moment, I can say. I found myself as a foreigner doing the main work in the, for the parliament in um, Germany. And um, I found there was a, I took a, a passage from Thomas Mann uh, where he talks uh, about the origin of life and with, juxtaposed it with a text by a woman by the name of Ricarda Holk, who, unless you're a German scholar, you wouldn't know, but Goethe said, um, uh, not Goethe, what am I saying? Uh, that Ma Thomas Mann said that um, she was the most uh, important woman in Germany. She actually was an early feminist. She was, lived in the East. And I thought there was a good, uh, some kind of a balance, at least, between a man and a woman, uh, which, if it's going to be the parliament, I damn better do. Anyway, so I did. And um, she wrote novels, and she also wrote this passage about the origin of his life as well, although she was primarily an historian. And, but to her credit, another reason why I, I chose her, is that when her Jewish friends were beginning to lose their job very early in that wonderful process, she resigned in protest. Not very many did. So uh, this is really quite large. You see there's a curtain wall in which you see the Bibliothek of Berlin and the water, and um, I did everything I could every morning uh, when I took my shower to not feel like Albert Speer when I did this work, I can tell you. Um, this is a former beer, um, uh, a brewery, which they wanted to make a cultural institution out of. But there are no windows. <laughs> so they decided to do a museum of light art. And there I was, ready for them. This is Hermann Hesse. This is one of those wonderful things that invitations in Italy. This is the photo Triano. I mean, it's like um, the beginning of a lot of things. Um, OK. Vitruvio uh, was the source for the basis of this marketplace, and it was a, an early and important theorist of architecture, some of you might know. And um, essentially, I took a paragraph of Vitruvio about architecture, and I made it into fragments, and took those fragments and put them with the fragments of what remains of the photo. So there we go. Let's see. Now we're at um, this is the Sigmund Freud Museum next to it, next door. And this was a butcher shop that was there um, when the uh, the doctor's office was open. And. Um, It's about memory and photography. I either have to say a lot or nothing. So yes, guess what? You're going to get nothing. There was someone who had the bright idea to do a lot of shows in little museums that surround Bolzano, Italy. 
And I was given, for some unknown reason, the typewriter museum. So, uh, but the museum was so hideous, I would refuse to marry my work to it. So I did billboards outside. And um, this, believe it or not, is the typewriter of Nietzsche, who was the first philosopher to ever use a typewriter. Henry James was the first novelist, in case anybody's interested. I was the um, centennial artist chosen by the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, um, and I did a few projects there over a period of a year. Um, one of them was the, a work on the wall around it. This is quite an amazing museum because this woman was, um, you know, a wealthy society lady on one hand, but um, actually a real, in another time would have been an installation artist. She did an incredible installation of all the things. She was the first collector. She sent this guy by the name of Bernard Berenson around Europe, to, and he would take pictures of things for her to buy, and she, he would send her the photos, and then she would choose. He was the first collector, I think, to choose in that manner. Um, and, uh, and then she installed everything in a very special way. But in her will, it said if anything is touched, all the work has to be sold and the money given to Harvard. So I had to work with a lawyer when I was there because they were kind of nervous about this. Um, anyway, I took, this is a lecture by Whistler, uh, an admonition to collectors. So I, I, that's what I put on the wall. But inside there are other things, but I don't think I'm showing them to you today. Sorry for that. I was, by the way, the, the work of the Foro Romano, of uh, the fragments, that was um, 30,000 meters covered. Okay. We're getting there, We're nearly done. This is um, in the year of the anniversary of Giordano Bruno. They didn't ask me to do it, but the Galleria Nazionale invited me to do a work in the courtyard. So it's in the museum, but outside. And uh, that's what I did. Oops, sorry. Another one of those stories, I can't say too much. But okay, I can read this. In 2006, I inaugurated a work based on the writings of Charles Dickens on, uh, on the wall at 22 Leather Market Street in London. My choice of material from my first public work in London reflected its location deep within the cityscape of Dickinsonian London, which is near where my studio is today. The location of both Dickens' own life as a child, as well as the fictional world that he created. Part of the material I work with as an artist is the context itself, with the history and location of the work being part of the experience of it. In his address at the inauguration of Leather Market Street, Professor Malcolm, sorry, Malcolm Andrews, the renowned scholar of Charles Dickens and editor of the magazine Dickinsonian, noted that Dickens was opposed to monuments his whole life. Indeed, he was repulsed by the very idea of them. However, he said, he felt certain that this work was one that he had no doubt that Dickens would have appreciated. <laughs> and that all took place in the pub, Dickens' favorite pub across from the work. And now we're getting toward the, I think the last, no, this is, This is uh, Vico, in, outside and inside, at Castello Rivoli in Torino.
these are um, the, the libraries of the, of the people quoted. So um, this is the language of, of equilibrium. Um, it's the Armenian island. Uh, it's from the Biennale of Venice and the island of San Lazaro. And the project in Yellow Neon has as its basis language itself. It is a work which is both a reflection on its own construction as well as on the history and culture of its location. This work is comprised of words from the Armenian, Italian, and English language. Language is here used as a signifier of the history of the project of the Mectanian order. Yellow Neon is chosen for this work because of the symbolic understanding of yellow at the time of the founding of the monastery as meaning virtue, intellect, esteem, and majesty. Bockler, 1688. Uh, the two supportive components of the work, based on the word water, are comprised of words arrived at through a view of their history and use. One aspect of this installation shows this relationship. The other part reflects the role of these words in Hagazian Pararan, or the Armenian Dictionary, 1749, written by Abbot Mekhtar, the founder of the order. The structure of this installation has two elements which are integrated on four diverse architectural locations, the bell tower, the northwest wall, the promontory, and the observatory. These four locations reflect both the diversity of the island's architecture as well as articulate the history and culture of the island. The work reflects the cultural and social history of the evolution of language itself, how the history of a word shows its ties to cultures and social uh, realities quite distinct and disconnected. It is only in the present when a word is used as it is, uh, as it is with a work of art being experienced that all, the work, all that which comprises the present find its location in the process of making meaning. Here in this work, language becomes both an allegory and an actual result of all of which it would want to speak. And I think this is coming up, so this Words like vodka and whiskey are all originally meant water. Fascinating, no? So these are the three languages. Armenian, because it's, this is the repository, really, from the diaspora of the Armenian culture. It was extremely important. Italy gave it to, uh, the, to, to the Armenians. Um, so it's an Italian, for them, Italian, because it's Italian soil, and English, because it's international viewer to the Biennalian, plus the artist speaks English, or at least a form of it. Um, I think we're at really, okay. This is an explanation we'll skip over. <laughs> so this is my installation at the Louvre. They invited me to go to the Louvre, walk around, pick a place you want to do a work. And um, I picked a, a passageway which um, they had never used for ex exhibitions. And it's where the visitors to the Louvre are moved around to different sections. Uh, oh yeah, there's a, something here. We're, so the first question Justine Sordagura asked me in our interview in the catalog to the Louvre, which I think is a useful beginning, is how and why have you chosen this very special place in the Louvre? This was my response. There were several reasons. First, I wanted a place was, which was, in a sense, generic Louvre. I wanted the sense of history, of the place, of art, suggested by the totality of the Louvre, with that providing a kind of tabula rasa upon which I could write. It is the cellar, the underground, and the weight of all that history is pressing down on it. Yet, it is an empty space one which is passed through on the way upstairs to see other concrete and specific fragments of our cultural history. When you are in the passage of the medieval walls, you sense the weight of history, almost as history itself, but it's not a specific history as the defined and articulated areas where these objects are upstairs. It is also appropriate that my work was one with the architecture itself, without the surplus meaning which the art and artifacts above provide. The foundation walls of the original Louvre Palace seemed well to be foundational at a place, as a place for me to produce the meaning which I wanted. 
I also like that the space is a passage. It's discursive, a location where one walks and talks on your way somewhere else. The box-like arrival location of rooms are often experienced as a series of end games where you stop and where the work plays its role as objects of contemplation and thus seems final and totalizing. I chose a similar kind of space, a passage from my show at the Hirshhorn some years before. There is a qual particular quality to the outside space in museum interiors, edging uh, work that seen there as the graffiti in relation to the more formal institutionalized stasis of the work in the rooms. Architecture is the most psychological of the arts. It defines the approach to work and frames your response to the kinds of meanings you can find in it. These spaces are freer, more open, obviously, and it permits a somewhat different kind of relationship with the work seen there. The area I chose of the Louvre is the psychologically interior street of the city of the Louvre. You're not in the house yet where the world's accumulated history of its culture resides. At this point, you can only anticipate that history. My ovals respect, reflect the history of the Louvre itself. All of the rooms upstairs constitute a specific history. My work was made for this location. It can never be larger than the context as it is. It is in, sorry. The only way I could confront and address the totality of the loop was where I did it. There on the facade, which wasn't available to me. The work is currently being uh, reinstalled at the Hall, Hall Charles V of the Louvre. Like the work's original location, this space is also part of the medieval palace and features the same characteristics, all the while being in a more publicly accessible part of the museum. The new location is within one of the pedestrian sub-passages leading from outside the street into the center of the Louvre. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's enough. Um, and this is... Pursuit Light, if you, can, if you couldn't imagine that possible. Um, it was um, a friend of mine uh, had inherited a piece of land and he built a house, uh, a, a, a large dog house, because he really likes dogs. Um, and so I did a, a lot of quotes about dogs all over. The one on this one says, some of my best leading men have been dogs and horses, Elizabeth Taylor. This is the inside. And this is a pro another project. I keep poor Paris, but anyway. Um, this is, there are four of these. This is only half of it. And there's a text by a very special one by uh, Michel Foucault. We'll, we'll go around. This is a project. It hasn't been done, regretfully. It's going to be made one day, but um, it's very expensive, and we're, we're looking for people wanting to donate. <laughs> Pass the hat, Anna. <laughs> uh, and I think this is the last one. Those, no, that's not. This is, uh, this is about a couple blocks. This is all over. This, it's the State Department in Holland. And um, I put up a bunch of naughty things, which nobody <laughs> realizes. Um, and uh, this is that. <laughs> Good, we're done. <coughs> this is Gratz. Three hundred years of silver mines in Norway, and I, this is called, uh, this is a monument. They all closed, um, and um, this, each one of these is one of the silver mines. <coughs> I, the text and the images don't seem to be really gyrating together right now, but um, this is this is the, <coughs> the end of it all. Carlos Scarpa. And a recent work I did, uh, it was a show done in honor of Stanley Kubrick. And this is the text from The Shining. And this, last but not least, is a very, very large project I'm doing for the, on the new train station in Taipei. I, <coughs> this was in the Venice Biennale this summer. It was one of four things I did there. And this is a wonderful bar 
called the Oriental Bar, where Freud spent time, as well as Verdi and a lot of other people, you know. And this is one of my large, largest of the Freud works, which is now being made permanent by the hotel. And this is the last thing I did. This is a show in London. Um, and um, these are works of mine from 68, mixed with um, paintings by um, uh, Fontana, Manzoni, Castellani. And this is a teaser of the work upstairs at the, sh the show uh, with Anna. This came out of the work at the Venice Biennale, which I showed you earlier. And now you can go have dinner. <laughs>